Welcome back to Ask a Creationist. I'm Todd Wood. I'm a young age creationist and president of Core Academy of Science. I'm here to answer your questions about creation, science, evolution, theology, the Bible, whatever you got. If I can't answer it, I got a lot of colleagues who know all sorts of things. They're very smart, and we would be happy to think about what you want to know and possibly include your question in a future episode of Ask a Creationist. Today we've got a challenging question. Is evolution racist? And I want to warn you ahead of time, we're going to look at racism. We're going to look straight at racism today. This may be ugly and unpleasant, so if you're sensitive about such things, be aware of that. But keep watching because you need to see this because it's an important subject. And I also want to emphasize before I even begin, I'm going to try to be as professional as I can about this, but a lot of what I'm going to talk about disgusts me. And angers me, and I don't want you to think my attempt at controlling my voice is somehow indifference or endorsement of anything that's about to happen. Because I don't like racism at all, and I hope you'll understand that. So is evolution racist? Well, it's complicated. When I see this claim online that evolution is racist, it's typically linked to uh, a little meme with the subtitle of Origin of Species highlighted, the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life. And so, of course, people say, look, evolution must be racist. It's right there inside the front cover of the book that started it all, right? This must be racist. Not long after that, very early in the 20th century, William Jennings Bryan becomes convinced that evolution is one of the causative factors of World War I. And he publishes his book in his image, which is published in 1922. It basically instigates the campaign that led to the Tennessee Evolution Bill and the Scopes Trial. And in this book, he links it very clearly. Evolution to Darwin's doctrine leads logically to war and to the worship of Nietzsche's Superman. The Bible tells us of the Prince of Peace and heralds the coming of the glad day when swords shall be beaten into plowshares and when nations shall learn war no more. And so here, Brian is sort of beginning the process where evolution is overtly linked to bad stuff happening in society. And we know not long after this book was published, we have the Holocaust. And everybody nowadays wants to blame Hitler on someone else. I see creationists regularly noting the link between the idea of radical competition and survival of the fittest to the Holocaust and to what Hitler did to the Jews. And then I see others trying to blame other influences as well. We're not going to talk too much about Hitler and uh, the Holocaust because I want to focus more closely on American racism and slavery because I think that's more relevant to our immediate situation, which I think you will agree is important for us to address. So let's get back to Darwin here. Was Darwin a racist? So on the one hand, the answer is no. Actually, by the standards of his day, Darwin was a rather fervent abolitionist. He hated racial abuses. He came from a long line of abolitionists. His grandfather, Josiah Wedgwood, worked in the abolition movement with Wilberforce to eliminate slave trade in Britain. His other grandfather, Rasmus Darwin, was also opposed to slavery. So in this respect, by the standards of his day, Darwin wasn't much of a racist. He wasn't the sort of angry, black person hating slave owner type at all. But yes, Darwin believed that white people were more advanced, more civilized, better than other races. He believed that the white race was the best race. And we can just look in Descent of Man his book on the origin of humanity, and we can see this very famously quoted passage at some future period, not very distant, as measured by centuries, the civilized races of man will almost certainly exterminate and replace the savage races throughout the world. Yeah, so this is not an endorsement of genocide. I think that's important to note here. Darwin is not saying we should go out and wipe out everybody who is not white European. He's sort of resigned that this is going to happen, though. This is a sort of a scientific prediction because he thinks white people are better than everybody else. So that's nice. So Darwin 
was a kind of a racist by modern standards, but not much of a racist by his own standards. Still, racism is racism, right? I mean, if you're a racist, you're a racist. Is there evidence then that future evolutionists or future people after Darwin used evolution to promote racism and racist behavior? And the answer to that is yes, in at least two different ways. First, the most obvious, the doctrine of social Darwinism, the idea that we can just apply sort of ruthless competition, survival of the fittest to human beings, that just let them fight it out, the good will survive, the unfit will die off, and good riddance to them, it'll make the race better in the process. Um, this was obviously disturbing to a lot of people. Uh, and it still is disturbing to me. More subtle was the idea of eugenics, the idea that we should pay attention to who we marry because we want to pass along good genes and improve our race and improve our culture. Now, that sounds interesting if you're just encouraging people to choose wisely when they get married. That I agree with that. That's a good idea. But that's usually not how eugenics played out. And we can see an example of this right here in Civic Biology, which is the textbook by George Hunter at the center of the Scopes trial. So this is a pretty famous book here. He has a section on eugenics where he says, when people marry, there are certain things that the individual, as well as the race, should demand. And then he goes through a number of things, including epilepsy and feeble-mindedness, or handicaps, which it is not only unfair, but criminal to hand down to posterity. The science of being well-born is called eugenics. So for Hunter, and for most biology textbooks at this period, eugenics was something they wanted to encourage, but that led to eugenics laws here in the United States where people were forcibly sterilized because they were judged to be, you know, feeble-minded or whatever, They're, you know, just prone to being crazy or something stupid. Um, and so they were sterilized without their consent. So it sounds kind of much better than social Darwinism, right? But it still leads to these horrific abuses of human rights and horrific abuses of justice. On the other hand, it looks like evolution is racist, but uh, every person of European descent in the 19th and early 20th century was racist by the standard of believing that white people were better than black people. I mean, that's just, that's just part and parcel of the culture at the time. It was an assumption that everybody had, at least the white Europeans had. And so it was unquestioned. And so there wasn't anything particularly racist about evolution of the period that wasn't also in every other aspect of culture. Um, so saying that, you know, Darwin is a racist is really no different than saying that Darwin lived in the 19th century or that evolution was used for racist purposes. Well, so was everything else in the culture. And I'm not making excuses. I'm just saying that. So evolution then by natural selection can only be racist if you actually believe the racist have a hierarchy of evolutionary fitness. That is, if you're already a racist. So if you already, you know, the idea of competition between groups of, of with organisms, populations of organisms, that's only going to lead to evolution if one has a fitness advantage over the other. So if they don't, then there's going to be a net neutral outcome. There's not going to be evolution. And so when I go to talk to modern biologists and anthropologists, I hear a lot of people talking very passionately about the equality of human beings and downplaying any differences between ethnic groups. They don't even talk about races anymore. And so they are evolutionists, and yet arguing for this sort of radical equality, this idea that everybody is exactly the same, there's no significant biological differences among the ethnic groups, well, that would make them evolutionists but not racist. So it's not a one-to-one -one correspondence. Just because you're an evolutionist doesn't make you a racist. And just because you're a racist, as we'll see, does not make you an evolutionist because racism existed before Darwin and evolution. So I think it's important to ask, how was it justified 
prior to the advent of evolution, which became a different tool that they could use. Which brings us to the unpleasant question, are creationists racist? And I think we have to look at this. I mean, we can't just go around pointing fingers at evolution and saying, you know, it's a racist theory and it started in racism and yada, yada, yada. We have to look at ourselves as well. Do, are we guilty of the same sin? And then we have to be careful about who we point our fingers at. And for this, to answer this question, we're going to have to look at some really ugly stuff. And we're going to start with slavery and racist apologetics from 19th century America. So, yeah, this American South held slaves in the 19th century. Not just held them, they abused and tortured them, took away their dignity, sold them as animals. How do they sleep at night? How do you do that and live with yourself, right? And there were a couple of ways that it was justified. One of the ways was the monogenist versus polygenist argument. So the monogenists argued that all people were descended from Adam and Eve, including uh, black Africans. And the polygenists said, no, black people are actually a different thing altogether than white people. And so some of them would argue that they're pre-Adamite humans, that there were humans, for example, created in Genesis 1. Those are not the same humans as Adam and Eve created in Genesis 2. That was one such example. Others would just argue that when God created humanity, in either one, Genesis 1 or Genesis 2, there were already humans around, and that those were the black races. And that Adam and Eve are the first white people. One rare argument was that black people are actually beasts of the field. They're animals. Uh, if you want to know more about that, I invite you to look up Buckner Payne, P-A-Y-N-E, and the Ariel Controversy. He's the one who promoted this idea that black people are actually just animals and we don't have to treat them any different than the rest of the livestock. I thought about including some quotes from Payne, but I just find him so absolutely abhorrent and disgusting. I don't even want to be guilty of remotely perpetuating, even in a scholarly manner, what he is promoting. So I'll tell you about it. He thought that black people were animals, um, but that's as far as I'm going. If you want to look at him up, that's your problem. God help you. The more common way of justifying slavery was the various curses in the Bible to argue that black people are in fact human beings, but they're cursed. Neither a curse of Cain, the mark that Cain bore because he slew his brother Abel, or the curse of Canaan, son of Ham, who mocked his grandfather Noah for his drunken nakedness. These were used to explain why black people are black and not white, and therefore also why they are inferior and deserve to be subjugated and treated like animals. Notice these are all creationist ideas. They're straight out of the Bible. So here's an example of a pre-Adamite work. This is 1880, Alexander Winchell's book, Pre-Adamite. And you can see the, the table of contents there. He's dealing with things that are near and dear to us as creationists. He's talking about the dispersal of the sons of Noah. He's talking about biblical languages. He's talking about Hebrew chronology, the, the genealogies of Genesis and, and the, the biblical records there. He's talking about who, who Ham was and who his descendants are. But his conclusion here is that uh, there were human beings that are not descended from Adam and Eve, that Adam and Eve are the first white people, and that the, the heroes of the Bible are all white people. And so, yeah, troubling. Troubling to see something like this with such serious scholarship about the Bible, which I love, devoted to such a vile and disgusting conclusion, which I detest and disgusts me. And of course, note the date here, 1880. This is well after abolition. So this isn't being used necessarily directly to justify slavery. It's being used to justify the ongoing segregation and terrorism of blacks in, so in Southern America that took place for decades after abolition. So slavery didn't just end, right? It just transformed into something different. And as I said, the more common explanation is exemplified here in um, James Smiley's 1836 ponderously titled pamphlet, a review of a letter from the Presbytery of Chillicothe to the Presbytery of Mississippi on the subject of slavery, in which he details a biblical 
and very much creationist uh, argument for why slavery is okay. Uh, Smiley was a Presbyterian minister in Mississippi. So here is what he says. In this section, I will examine the Old Testament. There it appears from Genesis 9, 25, 26, 27, that when there was but one family on the face of the earth, a part of that family was doomed by the father Noah to become slaves to the others. That part was the posterity of Ham, from whom it is supposed sprung the Africans. And he quotes the scripture. Detestable, again, to see someone who is, who is so deeply interested in the scripture, so deeply familiar with what it says, to twist it, to use it, to justify African slavery, it's very troubling, very, very upsetting. And it should anger you. And if it doesn't, you need to rethink your life. But you might say, hey, maybe those are just slavery apologists. What, what, what about sort of the regular creationists? What about people who are more in line with modern creationist concerns and motivations? People who are interested in geology and people who are interested in, in the flood and, and concerns of that nature. So what about modern creationists? All right, well, let's look at a few. Here's uh, George McCready Price, a uh, pretty well-known modern creationist progenitor. His work influenced pretty heavily Henry Morris and John Whitcomb's The Genesis Flood. Uh, this book, Phantom of Organic Evolution, was published in 1924, the year before the Scopes trial. It sold a lot of copies. And in this passage, uh, Price is writing about the um, Tower of Babel. And he says, and just as artificial barriers of language were interposed to keep them from again blending into one world embracing despotism, so we may well suppose that the barriers of race and color were also interposed at the same time. These racial barriers assisting in segregating the people of the world off into self-contained groups, thus most effectually preventing them from ever again uniting. And there is no doubt that if human beings had always been as true to natural instincts as are the species among the higher animals, there never would have been amalgamation among these races, which had thus been set apart from one another by a special intervention of providence. I've emphasized a couple of words there. Segregating, that's not randomly chosen. He's living in the era of segregation. He knows what it is. So don't think of this as just sort of an abstract scholarly discussion. He is justifying the segregation of his day using the Tower of Babel. God wants the races separated. That's why he confused their languages and probably created the racial differences as well. He sees these racial differences as barriers, and he points out here that there are natural instincts for people to prefer their own race and to not prefer other races. And the final word there, amalgamation, that I mentioned, amalgamation was a word that was used throughout the slave period as a slang term for whites and blacks getting together and having children. It was supposedly a great fear of the whites, that the black men were just going to go out and rape their white women. Of course, generally speaking, the reverse was true. It's the white men on plantations who were sexually abusing their slaves. But that's a story for another time. But amalgamation here, when, when Price uses it, it's kind of it's reminiscent of that language. He's got a negative overtone to it. But it's also reminiscent of passages from Ellen White. She had some very strange passages where she talked about amalgamation as one of the causes of the flood. She doesn't really define exactly what she means by it. Ellen White was the prophetess of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, of which Price is a part. So there might be more going on with his mention of amalgamation than just racism. Nevertheless, this whole passage reeks of a justification for segregation. And certainly I don't see any evidence of him speaking out against segregation. So was Price a racist? Sure. Another example here, Theodore Grabner. Grabner was a Lutheran minister, professor at Concordia Seminary in St. Louis, wrote several books on the science and the Bible, uh, wrote were very, he wrote a book on evolution that went through several editions. It was basically a popular summary of anti-evolutionist arguments of the day. Um, this particular book, Essays on Evolution, was published in 25. It's dealing very much with the Scopes trial. 
And reading this, I was absolutely floored when I got to this passage, which is basically on the second page of the main text. Meanwhile, the Ku Klux Klan has once more come to the rescue of Christianity. It has sponsored the anti-evolution bill and will devote to the suppression of the Darwinian doctrine hereafter what strength it could spare from its fight upon. And then he includes several profoundly objectionable racial slurs, which I will not even repeat because I'm not doing it. Yeah, so is Grabner a racist? I think Grabner is a racist by any... I, I can't see how you get away from that. <laughs> he, he's endorsing the KKK. Now, he might have changed his mind later in life. I don't know the full details of the biography of Grabner. But I know here in this passage, he is clearly endorsing the KKK. And their campaign of terrorism against black Americans. And Grabner is a creationist. So what should we say about all this? First thing I think we can say is that racists will use whatever they can, creation or evolution, to justify their racism. The problem is not some sort of philosophical foundation. The problem is sin. These people are not going to the Bible to find out what the Bible says about a matter. They're going to the Bible looking for reasons to justify what they already believe. And when what they believe is vile and contemptible and disgusting, then they'll find some way to distort scripture in order to justify their vile, contemptible, and disgusting beliefs. Same for evolution. And I want to point out here, evolutionists can be racist and creationists can be racist, but there's not a one-to-one -one correspondence. Being one or the other doesn't make you an outrageous racist. Just because you're a creationist doesn't mean you hate black people. Just because you're an evolutionist doesn't mean you hate black people. I know lots of people on the evolution side and the creation side who they're not racist at all. They're just as horrified by the current events as, as I am, and they're not racist. So I don't think it's fair to just lump them all together and blame racism on one group or the other. It's not that easy. And most disturbing is how much these conversations have included only white voices who discuss the origin, value, and meaning of people who look differently, all while social racism continues to endanger millions. And I'm thinking here not just of the, the period of slavery, but Reconstruction, the period of Jim Crow and segregation and lynching, terrorism perpetrated on black people, people losing their lives just because they walked down the wrong sidewalk. This is unacceptable. I think we all need to acknowledge that this is, this is horrifying no matter who you are, no matter what you believe about creation or evolution. So if you'd like to know more, I'm going to point you to this essay, and the link for this will be in the description by a guy named Barry Moore, who is a graduate of the Master's University in California. It was recommended to me by Joe Francis, who is a member of the administration there at the Master's University. He has an essay here that I thought was really great, What Can My White Friends Do?, addressing the current protests over the death of George Floyd at the hands of the police in Minneapolis. I think this has got a lot of great suggestions, and the first big suggestion is listen, um, to stop talking and to listen. So I'm going to stop talking, and that's all I have to say. May God forgive us.